appreciate it. I'm sure it's uh, going to be more than worth the effort. Um, this is a day of firsts. It's the first Robert A. Scott lecture, which was generously uh, initiated by Iris and Dale. The plane was canceled because of the same weather. You know, we, we miss them, but are grateful for their contribution. It's also our first collaboration with the UK Science and Innovation Team from the British Consulate General of San Francisco. Uh, thank uh, Mikey in particular for all our help in setting this up and also the team that came down today. We really appreciate your openness and generosity towards considering new ideas and potential collaborations. I think it's going to go someplace. Nick. Um, let me begin with five salient facts about Bob Scott. Uh, the first is, he was a legendary associate director here from 1983 to 2001, and then he came back again in 2009 uh, when the Caspis uh, was going through a transition, uh, having been independent uh, since 1954 until 2008, and uh, then joining Stanford. Bob was crucial in ensuring continuity and a smooth transition. And I personally appreciate that because you were key to recruiting me. Um, you were born in hometown Pennsylvania, <laughs> where he attended a one-room schoolhouse. Uh, he was in the faculty of Princeton for 16 years before joining us. Uh, he has become one of the world's experts on cathedral building and religious culture in medieval Europe. Nothing if not broad. And last, but probably most important, he is much loved, and it is a great pleasure to have a lecture series named after him, which will continue in the indefinite future. So again, thanks to Iris and Dale for initiating this, and to the UK for helping to support it. Um, it is appropriate that Miles be the first Robert A. Scott lecturer. When I was going to London in November, I was uh, eager to try to forge links with the UK, and I knew that Bob had had a lot of connections through cathedrals and other such things. <coughs> so I asked if there was someone there he knew who might be able to help forge a connection, and he immediately suggested Miles. So I sent an email to Miles, who was extremely responsive, and managed to set up a meeting with the Economic and Social Research Council people. And not only did he set it up, he actually came down from Oxford to London and took part in it and has been extremely helpful. And this is via Bob, via Miles. So my connection with Miles is, was via Bob. So it's completely appropriate from my perspective that Miles is, in fact, our first lecturer in this series. So let me say a few salient facts about today's speaker, Professor Miles Houston. Miles is the head of the Oxford Center for the Study of Intergroup Conflict at the Department of Experimental Psychology, University of Oxford. He has not once but twice been a fellow here. So it's good to welcome him back. Uh, Miles studied psychology at the University of Bristol, 1978, obtained his DPhil from Oxford in 1981, and his habilitation from the, probably wrong accent for that, University of Tübingen in Germany in 1986, previously held chairs in social psychology at the Universities of Bristol in the UK, Mannheim, Germany, and Cardiff in the UK. He's a fellow of the British Psychological Society, the Society for Personality and Social Psychology, and the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. And he's an academician of the Academy of Learned Societies in the Social Sciences. He was also recently elected to the British Academy. Uh, he is a past recipient of the British Psychological Society's Spearman Medal and its President's Award for Distinguished Contributions to Psychological Knowledge. It is a great honor and pleasure to have Professor Miles Houston with us here today. Please join me in welcoming him for this lecture on the impact of diversity on intergroup relations, the missing dimension of intergroup content. Good afternoon, everyone. Before we get down to the, to the science, uh, I'd like to say a, a few personal things um, about being invited to give this lecture. It was with very great pleasure, indeed, that I received the invitation to give the first Scott lecture. Like many young boys in Britain, I had been raised on tales, typically of heroic failure, 
of British expeditions to poles north and south. <laughs> what, though, was the link between the Center for Advanced Study, Stanford University, and the Antarctic? And how on earth did these people know that I was still devouring such tales, and how did they choose me to give this lecture to mark the centenary of the tragic end of Scott's race to the South Pole <laughs> in 1912? <laughs> a closer reading of my invitation, of course, revealed that this had nothing to do with Robert Falcon Scott, or Scott of the Antarctic, as he became known. This was the other great Scott. <laughs> Robert A. Scott, or Scott of the Center, as he became known. At this point, I began to see how I might introduce this lecture, praise and, of course, embarrass Bob, and contrast life in cold polar wastes with the warm, idyllic conditions on Alta Road, or Unipero Serra Boulevard, as it was when I first knew it. Consider the famous crew advertisement that my real hero, another Antarctic man, Ernest Shackleton, placed in the national newspapers ahead of his imperial trans-Antarctic expedition in 1914. <laughs> I'll read this for you. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, Bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. <laughs> in contrast, consider the invitation to be considered for a year at the center and how that might have read. <laughs> Men and women wanted for idyllic year in academic paradise. Generous stipend, almost always pleasantly warm. Not today, however. <laughs> All creature comforts provided, but Bob to complain to anyway. <laughs> Constant intellectual stimulation, likely honors and recognition will follow just because you are here. Bob made life at the center easy. He effectively ran the center as CEO and chief operating officer for much, if not most, of his 19 years here. And in that time, he was father confessor, intellectual sounding board, avuncular source of advice, academic matchmaker, or volleyball coach. Sometimes all of these things to not far short of, by my calculation, a thousand fellows. Above all, Bob was a facilitator. He made things happen, and he made them easier for fellows at the center. Effectively, he sublimated his own academic goals for the good of fellows. As he put it, I spend my time helping you guys to do all day what I would love to be doing myself. <laughs> Since retiring from the center, although he keeps coming back to perform yet another key role for it and for us, Bob has published two books, each received to critical acclaim. One, as we've heard, on the building of medieval cathedrals, another on miracle cures, thus reflecting the breadth and depth of his thinking, which went far beyond the discipline he was trained in and made his own contributions to, namely sociology. One can only wonder at how many dead trees there would have been if Bob had not given his life to the center, and thank goodness for us that he did. Assembled guests, friend of Bob, I never knew there were so many. It is an enormous privilege and personal pleasure to give this lecture today in honor of Scott of the center. And I ask you first to join me in publicly showing our recognition of and gratitude to Bob for 19 years of hard labor. Thank you, Bob. Okay, that was the fun bit. Now it gets hard. <laughs> okay. The outline uh, of my talk today is going to begin with the study of diversity, and in particular, some key and influential work by, by Robert Putnam. And I call these Putnam, Putnam's Pessimistic Prognoses, because Putnam published a very important paper uh, which reached some rather negative conclusions about our ability to live with diversity. I'm going to introduce what I think is a missing element in that analysis, which is the study of intergroup contact, the need to introduce whether contact is important, how it works. And I'm going to introduce those of you who need introducing to it to two distinct forms of contact, 
which I will label direct and extended forms of contact. I'm going to show you some of the marvelous ways in which intergroup contact does work, some of the ways in which bringing together members of different groups to do co cooperative things together, to have the positive experience of contact together, some of the many, many ways in which that impacts on, on all sorts of different things. I'm going to focus on one in particular, which now carries the name of secondary transfer effects, which refer to the fact that you can be brought together to experience positive contact with members of one outgroup, and that has positive knock-on or trickle-down effects on your attitudes towards a range of different outgroups. And I'm going to end up, in terms of data, talking about some archival reanalysis of contact effects in very extreme conditions, namely rescuers of Jews from Nazi Europe. And of course, I'm going to end up uh, by drawing some conclusions and by introducing some more speculative research from our current program, which, uh, in which I've done for the first time in my life, I've done some observational research on people in natural settings. So without further ado, let me go into, into Putnam's analysis. I ought to ask at this stage if there is a political scientist in the house. There normally would be here. OK, good. Please don't feel yourself put upon. Uh, I'm, I'm a great admirer of Robert Putnam's work, and I have a friendly academic dispute with him. I hope he'd, he'd say the same, and I hope he'll say the same when I, I start to publish more of this stuff. So he published this very influential paper in 2007 in which he contrasted two opposing positions. He called them threat theory and the contact hypothesis. According to threat theory, as you can see, the percentage of outgroupers, that might be the percentage of people of a different race or ethnic group, or it might be the percentage of immigrants. According to him, that percentage of outgroup members is likely to lead to perceived threat and competition. You, you perceive that you're competing over jobs, for example. You perceive that there might be a threat to your way of life. And that, in turn, is going to be associated with higher levels of prejudice. In contrast, the contact hypothesis says that percentage of outgroup members present in that environment provides an opportunity for contact. If you pick up that opportunity for contact, you might then forge outgroup friendships. That would be at the highest, most intimate level of contact. But you may just get used to hanging out with each other, getting to know each other, and those things would be associated with lower prejudice. By the way, I, I see somebody in the second row who is already my favorite person because she's making notes about what I'm saying. I'm more than happy to make this PowerPoint available to, to everyone, unless you're writing your shopping list, madam. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I normally do in talks. Conflict theory, according to Putnam, diversity fosters outgroup distrust and in-group solidarity. Contact hypothesis, this is the only bit where I really get mad with him. This is the only bit. And he says, I think it's fair to say that most, though not all, empirical studies have tended instead to support conflict theory. So he's not convinced by intergroup contact. This is his famous diagram where he shows on the uh, y-axis, trusting other races a lot, on the x-axis, uh, the mean Herfindahl inset, index of census tract ethnic homogeneity. He shows greater levels of trust for people who live in places like Bismarck, New Hampshire, Montana, Lewiston, Maine, lower levels of trust for people who live in diverse areas like the East Bay, California, and San Francisco. Well, the bit that seems to be missing here uh, is intergroup contact. He concludes his paper in a very famous uh, an way of, of looking at the problem. He says, in colloquial language, people living in ethnically diverse settings appear to hunker down. That is, to pull in like a turtle. And that's become a very widely quoted phrase. I think it's an incredibly pessimistic hypothesis. It's really telling us that, that we can't live with people who are different from us, whether it's in ethnic or racial or religious terms. There has been, since that paper, uh, a little sort of mini literature, and that has generated a number of studies supporting Putnam, more diversity, less trust, a number of studies opposing Putnam, more diversity, more trust, and a number of studies even showing no effect. It's a mess. It's a mess for all sorts of reasons, not least because people use different measures of diversity, people use uh, 
analyses that include or exclude other control variables and so on. So it's a fascinating, interesting area to work in. Some of the key things that have, have I think, been excluded are particularly the role of disadvantage. You do need to look at the fact that where members of different groups typically do live together, it often is in the face of, of economic disadvantage. There are arguments, which I'm not going to go into today, about how you measure diversity. Those are more issues for uh, demographers rather than social psychologists my, like myself. The bit that I think is missing is that there either is no measure of intergroup contact or there is an inappropriate level. So the measure in, con in Putnam's work is a high threshold measure. It's having out-group friends. And I think you often have quite low levels of intergroup contact. In, in my own country, it might just be that you chat to Asian taxi drivers when they pick you up. You chat to your local news agent who runs that sort of corner store that is often run by members of those different groups. That's not your friend, but you might still have quite uh, amicable civil uh, exchanges with that person. And that might have some impact on your prejudice levels, on your trust levels, and so on. Statistically, what Putnam doesn't do is he doesn't think about those measures of intergroup contact and what kind of qualifying effect they might have on diversity. In particular, does contact have its effects via contact? Sorry, does diversity have its effect via contact? Is there a mediating level? Or does contact only have its effects when there is a given level? of contact. And we've looked at those kind of things in our work. And our underlying theoretical rationale we owe to Gordon Allport, former Harvard psychologist, who published this wonderful book in, in 1954, has a famous chapter on the contact hypothesis, where he spelt out the straightforward idea that positive contact with a member of another group, often a negatively stereotyped group, can improve negative attitudes. Typically, we're not interested in just improving attitudes towards an isolated member or a small number of members of that group. We're trying to effect generalized change of outgroup attitudes. Does contact work? Well, Putnam says it doesn't work. He's pretty convinced of that. Yet there's an amazing meta-analysis done by Thomas Pettigrew and Linda Trott, published in 2006. They've recently published a wonderful book in 2011. Over 500 studies from the 1940s to the 2000s, 250,000 participants from 38 nations, and it's quite evident, if you read that meta-analysis, that there is a consistent effect. The more contact, the less prejudice. So why is it that these members of two different behavioral sciences are talking uh, across each other? And I might say in passing here that I think the topic that I'm addressing today is a perfect example of why you need somewhere like the Center for Advanced Study. You need people from all these different disciplines working together. So do we have enough evidence to challenge Putnam and impact policy? At this point, I'm going to be rude about social psychology, just so that the political scientists don't feel picked upon. I have spent a fair bit of my time standing in front of government committees, talking to local groups of people. Imagine how it would feel facing those kind of organizations if the only evidence that you had was based on your studies with undergraduate students. And yet, th that's what an awful lot of social psychologists do. Isn't that true, Brian? He doesn't. He's, he's one of the good guys. He, he has amazing samples, massive samples of real people, not students. So you try doing that, and you're left <laughs> exposed, overexposed. I wouldn't want to be that person. So the failures of social psychology include the failure to study contact over time, far too many cross-cultural studies, the failure to study contact to the level of the neighborhood. It may be one thing to meet members of different outgroups in the collegial setting of school, college campuses. It may be another thing to be, to be neighborhood uh, interactants. And it fails to study contact and diversity, taking account of deprivation as well as diversity. Finally, social psychologists have come relatively late to the idea of using multi-level analyses. I think political scientists and sociologists have been ahead of us, and we'll say a little bit more about that later. But what that primarily means is you look at individuals nested within greater organizations, neighborhoods, or settings. 
doing those kind of things, I think, is what social psychology has got to start doing. So I currently am involved in a uh, research project, which is an interdisciplinary one. It involves um, a sociologist, a political scientist, a public policy expert. We attempted, first of all, in a national survey of English participants, to test an integrated model of group threat theory and contact theory to measure all the variables specified by those different competing predictions that Putnam has introduced to us. And we deliberately sampled respondents from neighborhoods of varying degrees of diversity. This is not a, an attempt to have a random sample of English respondents. We've gone out and we've looked for people in neighborhoods that range in diversity and neighborhoods that range in their levels of deprivation. And of course, we've controlled for all the sort of things that you would control for. I'm not going to go into uh, detail of the methodological minutiae tonight. Those of you who understand the minutiae will twist my arm over drinks later, and I'm sure you will. So what we have is a, a, an ordered two-level structure, respondents nested in neighborhoods. Effectively, we're interested in testing the effects of diversity on trust. Trust is Putnam's uh, dependent variable of interest. We're going to look at out-group trust, how much you trust members of groups that you don't belong to. In-group trust, that's the hunkering down hypothesis. How much do you trust people who belong to the same group as you? And how much trust do you have in people who live in your neighborhood? We're focusing on the role of intergroup contact. To remind you before we look at the data, Putnam is suggesting that diversity is perceived as threatening and has negative consequences for trust. We are suggesting that diversity offers opportunities for positive contact. If you pick up those opportunities for contact, that lowers, reduced, uh, lowers perceived threat. And the prediction is that diversity will have a positive, indirect effect on trust. By living in a diverse area, you will have opportunities for contact. If you pick those up, your threat levels will be lower and your trust levels will be higher. So we've tested these on a sample of roughly 800 white British and a booster sample of roughly 800 minority respondents. And we find looking at the white British respondents first that diversity has that negative effect on trust just as Putnam predicts. But there is no link between diversity and perceived threat. Threat itself, as you would expect, is negatively associated with all three kinds of trust. But the missing element, the one that hasn't really been properly measured before, is that diversity is positively associated with intergroup contact. And if you pick up that contact, that contact itself is negatively related to threat. The more contact you have, the less threatened you feel. So, Diversity is having a positive indirect effect on trust. Methodologically, one of the things that we're still grappling with is over here you have this sort of Putnam effect and over here you have this sort of Houston effect. And we're still grappling with this idea of whether contact can be strong enough to actually overcome those negative effects that are present to some extent in that model. Look at the results for ethnic minority respondents, and they're very similar. Contact is, again, having this indirect effect. It's mediating the impact of diversity on both threat and trust. The next lot of analyses I want to show you are looking at what people in the literature call contextual effects. So we're asking here, do individuals from different contexts who have the same amount, the same level of contact, do they differ in their intergroup attitudes? If they do, then that must mean that the contact, the context is having some impact over and above individual level factors. In other words, there's, there's a contextual effect. There is something more than simply the average of individual levels of contact. Very briefly, just to give you an idea of the number of contexts in which we've, we've pushed this idea. These are our Leverhulme data from the UK, I should say specifically from England. We show at the neighborhood level, if you look at neighborhoods that are characterized by high levels of contact, those are neighborhoods that are characterized by low levels of bias. 
if you look at how that effect might be brought about, what are the mediating factors, you can show using the same kind of analysis that neighborhoods that are characterized by high levels of intergroup contact are, again, neighborhoods that have low levels of bias. They're also neighborhoods that are characterized by having more tolerant norms. And it's those tolerant norms that mediate the effect of the neighborhood on bias levels. We've also recently begun to test this idea longitudinally. So you're now doing longitudinal multi-level analysis, which apart from the fact that it's unbelievably difficult to do, and I have a team of much cleverer postdocs who do this for me, it's also incredibly expensive. And that's part of the reason why people haven't been doing this. We found a, a, a sugar daddy, or whatever the German equivalent of a sugar daddy is. He's Steve Vertefek, who directs the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen. And we collaborate with him and have got him interested in these kind of ideas. And he has funded a three-wave longitudinal study on diversity in German cities. And we have so far the data in from the first two waves. And we're able to show that intergroup contact at time one is associated with more tolerant norms one year on. Toler intergroup contact is also associated with lower levels of threat one year on. And tolerant norms at year one are associated with lower levels of threat. Obviously, what we're hoping to show is in the third wave of data that contact at year one predicts norms at year two predict uh, outcomes, in this case, perceived threats at year three. So we're trying to fill some of those gaps. Is E pluribus unum, that was the title of Putnam's paper, is E pluribus unum a dead turtle? Well, it may be too soon to say it is, but to assess the impact of diversity on social and political attitudes, I'm arguing very strongly, you have to assess contact. You have to assess self-reported quality and quantity of contact. Why does all this matter? Well, it matters because Putnam has had the ear of many prime ministers and presidents. It matters also because of the way people are using Putnam's data. And obviously, Putnam is not remotely responsible for how people are using his data. Uh, now, I'm going to make enemies tonight because I'm being honest and I'm having fun and so on. If there's somebody's Richard Sennett's best friend, I'm in trouble here. Um, but Richard Sennett's just published this book, which my wife turned up with the other day. And I said, oh, that looks interesting. And I flick through it. And I find on page five this amazing quotation. Uh, Will first-hand experience weaken stereotypes? And that's basically exactly the question that Pettigrew and Tropp have answered with their meta-analysis of 500 studies. That was the belief of the sociologist. I've always wondered how to pronounce his name. Stam, Sam? Stauffer. I'm sure I heard three different answers then. <laughs> Sam Stauffer, who observed during the Second World War, and this is a famous study, many people will know it, that white soldiers who fought alongside blacks were less racially prejudiced than white soldiers who had not. Earlier, um, Senate has talked about Aristotle as well. He then goes on, the political scientist Robert Putnam has stood Stauffer and Aristotle on their heads. Putnam has found that first-hand experience of diversity, in fact, leads people to withdraw from these neighbors. The bit that's wrong about that quotation is that that's absolutely not what Putnam has done. First-hand experience means what? First-hand experience means having contact. You could be living in a diverse area and withdrawing and having no contact. I will end up my talk today of an example of a diverse setting in which people are doing that to some extent. So it, it, it really is bad, very bad, to draw that conclusion. I, and I think that that study by Sam Stauffer was an amazing study. And it absolutely has not been stood on its head. And I'm not just saying that because he was a sociologist and I want to be nice to Bob. <laughs> so, so far, we've talked about direct face-to-face -face contact. Well, there turn out to be some interesting varieties of contact. Quantity of contact, obvious kind of questions. How often do you have such and such an interaction with someone? The quality of contact. Is that contact friendly or unfriendly? Uh, is it positive or negative? Probably the variable that social psychologists place most faith in is cross-group friendship. It's the highest level. It might be the hardest one to achieve, but it's the one that 
that has the greatest effect. The interesting new variable is the notion of extended contact, sometimes called indirect, sometimes called vicarious contact. We owe this to a, a, a paper by Stephen Wright and colleagues in 1997. This is the idea that typically through your family and your friends, you might have access to outgroup members. So you might have people living in your family, people in your close friendship network who themselves have outgroup contact even though you don't. So it's a very indirect relationship, but it's one that has been shown to have quite profound effects, and I'll show you some of them. So far, we have a literature of over 500 studies, most of which have been cross-sectional. That's a clear weakness. We have a number of experiments. The experiments are very important for demonstrating causality, but it is a weakness to rely this much on cross-sectional evidence. So I set myself the target of trying to do more and more longitudinal work. We've now got quite a bit of it going, quite a bit of it already coming through. I want to tell you about one study just to illustrate the way it works and to illustrate some of the complexities. This is a study we did in Stellenbosch, South Africa, with a marvelous graduate student of mine, Hermann Swart, who was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. And uh, if you look at the map of Stellenbosch, you'll find there is a large white area there's a small black area, and there are two small so-called colored areas. And we got access to a school in the colored area, and we got access to a sample uh, of students there who started off at around age 15. We tracked them on three occasions um, through till nearly 16. And we measured whether they had any cross-group white friends. We measured their empathy and their anxieties about having contact. We measured various outcomes, like what their attitudes were. A measure that we use quite often in social psychology, which we call outgroup variability, perceived outgroup variability. Do you perceive them, those outgroup members, to be more or less all the same, or do you perceive differences within them? And we measured negative action tendencies. How strong were your inclinations to behave negatively towards them? This is a three-wave, cross-legged, cross-lagged analysis. And what we're trying to, to test is the idea that predictors at time one affect mediators at time two, which affect outcomes at time three. So you've got to measure all these variables, and you've got to do it first at year one, then at year two, and then at year three. And this generates unbelievable complexity. Let's not get caught up in the complexity, the spaghetti, as I call it. What we're interested in, the green paths have just got to be there for statistical reasons. They're the autoregressive paths, the relationship between the same variable measured at two points or three points of time. The blue paths are the forward paths. They're the paths predicted by the contact hypothesis. And the red paths are the reverse paths. And we need to look at those too because there might be self-selection biases. There might be bigots who avoid contact, and there might be, if you like, liberals or multiculturalists who seek out contact. And when you simplify that analysis by focusing just on those effects, that's exactly what you find. You find that people who have outgroup friendships at time one have lower levels of intergroup anxiety and have greater empathy at time two. And if you have anxiety at time two, that's associated with uh, less intergroup, less variability. It's and uh, if you look at empathy, it is associated with more positive outgroup attitudes, with greater perceived variability, and with lesser negative action tendencies. So those paths are all going exactly as the contact hypothesis predicts. There is, however, also evidence for the self-selection bias. If you have positive outgroup attitudes at time one, or negative action tendencies, those are positively and negatively related to empathy. So you can't rule out that some people who are positive seek out contact and some people who are negative avoid it. And if you have anxiety at time two, that leads to you forming fewer outgroup friendships. So it, it, is, it is a bi-directional relationship. What matters, however, is that we've shown the blue paths. And that means there is an effect from contact to these outcomes. And that means that you can place faith in contact as an intervention. There is an effect from contact to these outcomes. Extended contact is what I, I call 
the sometimes surprising impact of weak ties. Does it really help if some of your friends have friends who are Jews, blacks, Brits, sociologists, or whatever? Extended contact is secondhand, so you're not yourself having experience of outgroup members. But just knowing people, and even stronger, observing people who belong to your group, having those kind of contacts does have a positive impact. I've done a lot of my work in Northern Ireland. This is just a, a, a map to give your minds a quick break between all the numbers, a map of the political geography of Belfast. If Belfast were truly mixed, that whole map would be yellow. Okay? Instead, you get great red areas, which are Protestant, great green areas, which are Catholic. So we've been doing work there for about 15 years, I guess, now. One of the studies we did tested this uh, extended contact idea. We measured whether people had direct outgroup friends. How many friends do you have, if you're a Catholic, who are Protestant? And we measured indirect friends. If you're a Catholic, how many of your Catholic friends have Protestant friends? We measured at the dependent variable side prejudice, and we measured general group variability. If contact is having positive effects, it's going to make attitudes more positive, and it's going to make you perceive the outgroup as more varied. And we show effects for both kinds of contact, number of direct friends and number of indirect friends, and they're mediated by this intergroup anxiety variable. We find this central in much of our research. People are nervous, they're apprehensive, they're worried about having contact with other groups. If you have direct friends or if you have indirect friends, that anxiety is reduced. And the way this analysis is done, you can look at the effects of the indirect friendships and you are controlling for the number of direct friendships. So we are looking at a pure effect of indirect friendships. The more data I gather on this hypothesis, the more impressed I am. It's not my hypothesis, it's Steve Wright's hypothesis, but I think indirect contact is a very powerful idea. Some of the many things that we have shown about it, we've shown that it works by changing group norms. We've shown that it's especially important, as you would expect, for people who don't have direct contact themselves. And we've shown that if you give people the experience of extended contact at one wave in your design, those people are more likely to uptake opportunities for direct contact in the future. It's a very powerful effect. Now, so far, we've shown cross-sectionally, we've shown longitudinally evidence for this hypothesis. I live in a world which is inhabited by experimentalists. They don't believe any of this bullshit. They want an experiment. And unfortunately, actually, as I'm getting older and older, I have less and less faith in experiments. You need to straighten me out later, Brian. But I do. I, I worry. I don't sleep at night. I worry about external validity. And it gets worse, doctor. I can't deal with it. So anyway, we did a study, and I felt a bit better since uh, I did the study. So we did this study in Cyprus. One of the most wonderful things about my job is I, I get fantastic students who come not to work with me, they come to be at Oxford and they bump into me. And then they go and collect data in wonderful places. Now Cyprus used to be a place with lots and lots of mixed villages. And then there was an invasion by Turkey in 1974. And then it was a split across the middle, a UN line, and there is a Turkish Cypriot republic in the north and a Greek Cypriot part in the south. These people have almost no contact with each other anymore. So they're ideal for such a study. We did a study uh, done by my, my graduate student, Maria Ioannou. We took 52 female students and we took them as pairs, 26 pairs. They were recruited at the University of Cyprus and they came along to the study as pairs of friends. And at the university, what we did is we gave them a pre-test baseline measure of prejudice scores. One week later, we intervened and we gave them an experience of contact. And we gave them either an experience of direct contact or an experience of extended contact. So how did we do this? We randomly allocated each of them to one of two conditions. The direct contact condition, these are people with no contact at all with Turkish Cypriots. They got to interact for 10 minutes face to face with a Turkish Cypriot who was a confederate of ours. 
They were paid to be there. They were paid to respond in exactly the same way to every participant. I'm getting back my love of experiments as I tell this. This is the beauty. This is the beauty of control. Control. You can be sure what's happening. Now, this I'm really proud of. All my life, I've been in psych departments with a one-way mirror. I've always wondered what the one-way mirror was for. I finally, I've done a study with a one-way mirror. So we had these people randomly allocated to the two conditions. And one of these guys gets to watch their friend having contact with an outgroup member through the one-way mirror. And I just love this. It makes me so happy. Don't look at all those numbers. This is just to remind me to say to you that the attitudes at the end of the, the first stage of contact were remarkably positive. They see the outgroup member as quite typical of Turkish Cypriots. They themselves report disclosing. They report that the outgroup member disclosed to them. And their, their salience levels are reasonably high because you want people to see that person as an outgroup member. Otherwise, you won't generalize. And you want, uh, hopefully, to be reducing anxiety through this process. And the results show that if you look at uh, the blue histogram for direct contact, if you go from time one, the baseline, to one week later, you've considerably increased the positivity of those, uh, those attitudes. If you look at the extended contact, well, you've increased those attitudes as well, but by not nearly as much. Makes a lot of sense to me intuitively. The direct contact effect is the stronger effect, but the extended contact effect is still there, and you can show it experimentally. Well, so far we focused on, on attitudes as the outcome measures. I wouldn't want anyone to go away tonight thinking, well, okay, so contact affects the attitudes. Does it do anything else? In our research, we have built up ever greater evidence for the fact that contact affects explicit attitudes, these pencil and paper direct measures of attitudes, something we call attitude strength, which is um, an indication of how reliably your, uh, your attitude can be said to be a predictor of behavior, to resist counter-information, to guide information processing. We've looked at implicit attitudes. We have Brian Nozek in the audience here, who's one of the world experts on implicit attitudes. These are compute, typically computer-based tasks which assess people's attitudes in ways that they can't control. So we've overcome any doubts about socially desirable responding. We've even done some studies with neural processes. We've shown that you can get people's brains to respond differently to faces of outgroup members as a result of their levels of contact. I've done work in conflict areas like Northern Ireland where I've shown that contact is associated with greater trust for outgroup members, with greater willingness to forgive outgroup members for things that have been done uh, in, in an often terrorist past. We've shown greater behavioral intentions. And we've shown this relatively new effect, sometimes called outgroup to outgroup generalization, more recently called by Tom Pettigrew, secondary transfer effects. Can you show that contact with members of one outgroup leads to more positive attitudes towards other outgroups? So I'm going to show you just a couple of bits of data from that, because I, I think it's such a neat, what I call it a knock-on or a trickle-down effect. These are two studies which sort of trade off their, their strengths and weaknesses. The first is a huge cross-sectional study, eight European countries, got 1,000 participants in each. We've measured something called social dominance orientation as well. This is a, an ideology that supports inequality. So we've controlled for this, and we've looked for its moderating effect. And we've got data from a 30-minute computer-assisted telephone interview. So we're able to show for the whole sample, I'm not going to go through each of the countries, we're able to show that contact with immigrants, that's the primary outgroup that we're interested in, is associated with directly with uh, less negative attitudes towards a completely different outgroup, in this case homosexuals. It's also negatively associated with attitudes towards uh, negative attitudes towards immigrants or prejudice, so the more contact you have, the less prejudice. And then you have these mediated effects through changing attitudes towards the primary outgroup. You have these knock-on or trickle-down effects and you promote uh, less prejudiced responding to these two outgroups, on the one hand homosexuals, on the other hand Jews. 
There is some role for social dominance orientation. That first path there is much stronger and only significant for those people who are low in that kind of ideology. But the overall mediation from contact with the primary group via attitudes towards that group to attitudes towards the secondary group, that overall effect is significant, uh, whatever your levels of SDO. Those data, of course, are cross-sectional. Huge samples, but cross-sectional. Back to Northern Ireland again. This is another beautiful illustration of segregation in Northern Ireland. That's the River Foyle that flows through the city of Derry. Derry is such a conflicted city that it's called Derry if you're a Catholic and it's called Londonderry if you're a Protestant. So they, they call it sometimes Derry Stroke Londonderry. And there's a disc jockey out there who now calls it Stroke City. <laughs> this is a longitudinal study. It's much smaller, although by the standards of social psych studies, it's still got a, a reasonably large sample. Um, we've taken people. We've matched them one year on. We've measured their attitudes to, this is a bit of a mouthful, the ethno-religious outgroup. So this is for Catholics. It's their attitude to Protestants. For Protestants, it's their attitude to Catholics. We measure their neighborhood contact with that outgroup, and we control for attitude, for contact with and attitudes towards Racial minorities. Racial minorities here, a very different secondary outgroup than the primary outgroup of Catholics or Protestants. We can show that that level of contact promotes more positive attitudes to the primary outgroup, and that in turn <coughs> promotes at time two, one year on, more positive attitudes to racial minorities. So Tom Pettigrew has thought about these secondary contact, these, these uh, secondary transfer effects as evidencing a kind of deprovincialization, he calls it. People are less persuaded that the in-group is the center of everything, that everything should be rated with respect to the in-group, which is the definition of ethnocentrism that William Graham Sumner gave uh, many, many years ago. We've shown this effect now cross-sectionally with massive samples and longitudinally with smaller samples, all with real people, not with students, I emphasize. The last bit of quantitative data I want to show you um, is a very different kind of analysis. And this is the first time I've, I've really got uh, interested in some archival analysis. And one of the things I've had most fun with in, the, in this whole project is collecting data in lots of interesting places and collecting lots of interesting types of data. So doubtless inspired by Bob, I found myself collaborating with all these sociologists. So this is a collaboration with a wonderful young sociologist, Clemens Cronenberg in Mannheim, who told me in the context of another project we work on that he was doing some work on this famous data set where um, Olena and Olena had studied people who had risked all to help Jews after the Holocaust. And uh, I said, wow, I never knew you could get hold of that data. Uh, and, and it is possible to get hold of that data and, and to carry out some analysis on it. So this data comes from the improbably named Altruistic Personality and Pro-Social Behavior Institute, <laughs> a, appropriately enough located in California. Um, <laughs> and I think it's a really, really clever idea. It's, it's what a methodologist would call a case control sample. So you start off with the people you're interested in. These are the people who helped Jews to escape from Nazi terror in Europe. How do you know they did that? Well, you collect information from them, from Yad Vashem, which I'm sure is a place many people in this room will have visited. There are lists like the Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Authority, the so-called Righteous Among the Nations, other people who have eternal gratitude in the minds of Jews for having risked all and helped Jews at this time. And then you have a matched sample, matched on age, sex, education, and so on. It gives you a, a final sample. You started off with <coughs> about 600 odd and there's some missing data at various bits of the, the data collection. You end up with about 400 respondents, nearly 300 rescuers, 115 non-rescuers. And the idea of these researchers was to see what was different about the people who rescued and the people who didn't. And my interest was piqued in this data when I realized that there were some measures of contact in there. So the main hypothesis that we sought to test here was what was the role of having pre-war friendships? Pre-war friendships with Jews should increase the probability 
of rescuing Jews, especially Jewish friends. So it's a test of direct contact, and it's a rare test of direct contact with a behavioral outcome. Now, people get, appropriately enough, people get pessimistic about contact. When I go and give talks in Europe, people say, well, if contact is so marvelous, why did former Yugoslavia unravel? Well, contact is not a magic bullet, and, and this data set reminds you that even when the risks for themselves were enormously high, people who did have these experiences when they were growing up can be shown to have behaved differently and more altruistically. So what we're doing here is a form of analysis that I probably had never even heard of until I met Clements, which is a multinomial logistic regression. And it turns out these things are widely used by sociologists, I now know. And the data that we're looking at here, these coefficients, are odds ratios. And I'll explain in a second what they are. And you can see in the first slide here that what is the role of having pre-war friendships with Jews if you are a Gentile? Well, those friendships make you much more likely to have helped Jewish friends, and they still make you significantly likely to have helped other Jews, even if they weren't your friends. Now, these, these bits of data have been reported as correlations by others, namely Thomas Pettigrew. But I never realized you could get hold of these data. You need to get hold of the data because you need to control for all other things. A zero-order correlation is a very messy bit of data in this case. So what does the odds ratio mean? It's calculated as the probability of helping Jewish friends divided by the probability of not helping them. And if you had those friends, you're 12 times more likely to have helped than if you did not have those friends. And you're just over two times more likely to have helped non-friends. So it's, this is a pretty impressive effect. What about the other controls? And here I <coughs> take my hat off to Olena and Olena because they thought to measure so many interesting things in their study. So they've measured not just the pre-war friendship with Jews, which, but also the age of their respondents. They've measured the pro-social orientation. The, the place typically that cites Olena's work is the chapter of a textbook on altruism. It's the most famous study on on pro-social personality attributes. They've also looked at the command zones. Were people more likely to help in some command zones of Nazi Europe than others? They've looked at the size of the Jewish population in those areas. This is really interesting. They looked at the number of rooms people had in their house. If you have more rooms in your house, you have more opportunity to secret away a, a, a Jewish person. And then this is the really interesting one too. I put this one in red because it's the only one that goes in the opposite direction, having many neighbors. If you live in a secluded farmhouse, you can hide this person. If you live overlooked by other people, uh, this is going to have a, a negative impact on your likelihood of helping them. And when you include all these control variables, you still find a whoppingly significant odds ratio, <coughs> especially for helping Jewish friends, but also for helping other Jews in general, which I think is pretty amazing support for the contact hypothesis for this opportunity to mix with members of this particular outgroup when you were growing up. Okay, the last bit of data I'm going to subject you to this evening is I always worry. I told you I worry. I worry all the time. So I worry about whether I'm being too Panglossian. You know, is everything for the best in this best of all possible worlds? It isn't. It isn't. And people who work in this area talk about segregation. They talk about desegregation, which, of course, you did after 1954 here in your schools. And now people are talking about resegregation. Resegregation is going through the front door of your mixed high school and then going in different directions when you go in there. The black kids might all group together and play one sport or do one thing, and the white kids might group together and play one sport and do something else. In my own country, it's typically not black kids and white kids. It's in terms of the, the current pressing social problems, it's white British kids and it's Muslim Asian British kids that people are worried about. So as part of this big research project I work on at the moment, uh, we got the opportunity to do a study in the cafeteria uh, of a sixth form college. This is a college that educates 16 to 18 year olds. This is a town, Oldham, on the edge of Manchester that has uh, a minority population which is mostly uh, Asian British of Bangladeshi and Pakistani heritage. It's about 17% in the population, but it's such a good college, it draws in people from outlying areas. 
After riots in 2001, this school has gone from strength to strength academically, and it's got 40% ethnic minority students. It's plenty of opportunity for mixing. And in this uh, college is a huge cafeteria that seats about 400-odd people. And um, what we did is we broke this area, this whole area, into some smaller units. And I, I just called them Area 1, which is this sort of area here. And Area 2, which is this area here. Area 3 and Area 4. And I didn't just dream up these areas. They're actually... Um, they're formed geographically by things like walls, coffee stalls, food service counters, and so on, so that you, you can't see some bits uh, because there's something in the middle. This made our job easier. I then recruited four wonderful undergraduates who, who took part in this as their final honors thesis, and I situated them in each area here, and I had a fifth one who rotated so that we could check on the reliability of our coding. And I got these guys to code over a two-day period, over 3,000 seating positions. I love undergraduates, especially undergraduates at a school that, where they think hard work is fun. <laughs> uh, we measured every single index of segregation that we could find in the literature, side by side, face to face, social units. We did them all. In the key that you see here, I've used this revolting sort of purple-pink color to designate Asian and the yellow to designate white. Forget about the others. There are very few numbers of, 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 of other groups. And we've coded 22 time intervals over these two days with a little refresher break in between so that the population can come in and out. On a bad day, there is one mixed unit in one interval there in a college which has got 40% ethnic minorities. It varies depending on the time of day. And that's about as good as it gets. Okay, You've got one, two, three, four, five mixed units in there. Amazingly, across all that work, four, just over 4% of the social units that we coded are mixed, involving whites and Asians. You can look at this in all sorts of different ways. Um, using this ethnic aggregation index, you can go through each day, day one and day two. You can look at each of the areas. Um, you can look at the number of intervals that we coded. And it's something about area one. Area one seems to be picking out this very high uh, ethnic aggregation index. Area one is this area up here. When we did this research, nobody in the school was aware of this at all. But Area 1 turns out to be the Asian area. This is where these kids are tending to sit. Not all of them, but on the next slide, you can see that whites, whites spread themselves reasonably evenly across days and across areas into what are possible seating areas, whereas Asians sit predominantly in area one. Why are they doing this? So there's a famous book published in the US called Why Do All the Black Kids Sit Together in the Cafeteria? The question is often asked, I've never really had a satisfactory answer to it, and we're pursuing that now. But the reason I want to end up with it is that I want to ram home this point that having a mixed neighborhood, having a mixed student body does not equate with intergroup contact. Students do, in fact, in this college, because we have lots of other data from them, they do report having out-group friends, just as you would expect. Having out-group friends and having more contact with those out-group members is uh, associated with lower levels of prejudice. But why do they choose to sit apart at lunch? And actually, does it even matter that they do? So psychologists have got very interested in, in uh, all sorts of aspects of this work. So there's some fantastic work done by, by Nicole Shelton, which suggests that particularly white majority members seem to find these interactions with out-group members quite mentally taxing, quite exhausting. So you know, maybe this is actually not negative at all. Maybe people are just taking a break and having lunch with their closest friends and chilling out and just not subjecting themselves to, to, to what is a difficult, apparently difficult cognitive task. And we're pursuing that. Um, 
And at the moment, our, our evidence is that it is not primarily driven by negative attitudes. It's not driven by having low levels of anxiety. It's actually driven, uh, in the case of the whites, by indifference. And it's driven, in the case of the Asians, by the perception that those white kids don't value diversity. So these are all sorts of things that, that we have still to pick up on uh, in the future. I leave you with that because we don't have all the answers. We have lots of interesting questions we're still asking. So to draw together some conclusions, the first one is that actual contact is crucial for integration. I urge you to read every study you ever read on this topic hereafter and say, well, did they actually measure contact or did they just measure how many people were in the room from each group. Just living together, just eating together is not enough. We have shown in the first survey I presented you this evening that contact does mediate the effects of neighborhood diversity. It's the intervening variable. And on that basis, I don't want to say that Putnam is wrong, but I think he's far too pessimistic. I've also introduced you to the difference between direct and extended contact. And I think extended contact is a very, very powerful idea. I think those people who have anxiety about meeting the other side can be helped towards meeting the other side by seeing that it's a little behavioral experiment that some of their friends are doing and some of their family members are doing, and it can work out OK. Contact has multiple outcomes. Our government researchers like to talk about soft and hard outcomes. And most of our outcomes are soft. They're, they're attitudinal. But we've shown also some behavioral evidence. And I think things like secondary transfer effects are actually incredibly impressive because we live increasingly not just in black, white worlds or white Asian worlds, but in, in, in areas of what my, my German Max Planck, Planck colleague Steve Vertebeck calls areas of super diversity. You know, areas like Newham in South London, which, in, in London, which have you know, people from 150 nations living there. So it's not, it's not just a, an in-group, out-group context. And I was always hugely influenced when I was a student by the notion of triangulation, by trying to show that you could answer your research question of interest using lots of different approaches. And we have cross-sectional, we have longitudinal surveys, we have some experiments, we even have some archival analysis. The bottom line is, I think to understand diversity effects, you have to study contact. And as a final word, I'll say, you have to collaborate across social science disciplines, just as this place endorses, because it's impossible for any one of our disciplines to do it right on their own. Thank you very much.